Yeah, so like Yanis mentioned, my name is Josh. I recently published a book through Repeater Books called Blockchain Radicals, How Capitalism Ruined Crypto and How to Fix It. Um, and so for this presentation, I kind of wanted to go through a bit of the overarching structure of the book, of how, like the framework that I use to kind of uh, think about crypto. Um, and then also related to sort of like the art aspect, since this is a, an arts related uh, presentation. Um, so a little bit about me. I, yeah, have started, I started the Blockchain Socialist uh, a bit over three years ago as a blog at first. Um, then I realized it's really difficult to publish something every week, so I started doing podcasts as well to make it a bit easier. Um, I was kind of pseudo-anonymous for a while because I was working sort of a normal job and I didn't really want them to know about what I was doing. I've been doing that uh, for about five years. Um, and then I have a couple of other side projects, also working on a documentary. On the podcast, I've also been focusing a lot on providing a critique of the network state and trying to come up with sort of like alternative imaginaries to kind of very similar types of ideas that are explored there in the book that aren't so right-wing as, as Balaji's. Um, and then this is the kind of like uh, avatar that I use uh, everywhere. Um, but so for the book, um, I'm starting to realize as I was listening to everyone else's presentation that like a lot of, I felt a lot of things kind of resonated with um, kind of my thinking about the book, uh, which is really nice. But the kind of framework that I used was Deleuze's critique of representational thinking. And so um, for people who may not know too much about this, Deleuze, um, for him, uh, he thinks that oftentimes we use models of the old and we kind of impose them on the new as a way to kind of understand new things. Um, we kind of take uh, it as a way to be able to um, make sense of, of something. Um, this, however, for Deleuze is very uh, problematic. It's very limiting to our ability in being able to fully, truly comprehend and understand uh, a thing because we're always comparing it to some sort of ideal. Um, so so the, the ideal representation of a thing. So um, the example that I like to use that I took from a guy named Jonas Jelka, who's a YouTuber, uh, is the example of the drum machine. The drum machine was a piece of technology uh, that was imagined as something that you would buy as a replacement for your drummer not being able to come to drum practice, right? Um, the drum machine, you would buy it, you would set the rhythm on press, by pressing the buttons, and then you would press play and you can play your guitar along with it. In this model of the drum machine, the drum machine is a representation of a drummer with a drum set. Ideally, you would have your drummer come to practice, um, and you would uh, not have to use a drum machine, but because you don't, you have the drum machine as a replacement for. So the ideal form of all this is the drum machine. Um, and the way that he imagines this is this is like uh, thinking like a tree, he calls it arboreal thinking, where the platonic ideal of the drummer with the drum set is, at, is sort of like the base, and then these branches that come off are just representations of it like, like the drum machine is. Uh, however, what kind of happened throughout history is that people took the drum machine, of course, and it revved it up. They revved it up in ways that a drummer could never play their drum sets, right? They created new genres of music, created techno, electronic music. It also augmented existing types of music. Um, so in, in a sense, you can think that the drum machine kind of went past beyond its representation that was, it was originally imagined in. Or alternatively, you can think that Thinking like this, thinking that the drum machine was just a representation of a drum set, was always the incorrect way to think about it, right? It was, it was never correct, and that by applying this type of model to thinking about stuff is always going to be problematic um, because it limits the way that we think about the use of, of, this, of technology in particular. Um, and so Deleuze, the way he kind of like describes this abstractly, uh, right? On one way, we have thinking like a tree, but instead, um, he really likes potatoes, and he says that we should be thinking uh, rhizomatically or in the shape of something that doesn't have like a very clear center as a way to be able to um, be more able to kind of realize the potential of things. Um, and so using this framework, I applied it to the crypto world in which I found that representational thinking is endemic in the crypto world. It's basically all over the place and it's been there since the beginning. Um, so Right, Bitcoin was originally imagined as a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, so people had this imagery of using cash uh, electronically, but then that narrative sort of has shifted, and now the dominant one is this one of digital gold, where Bitcoin is 
a form of digital gold, so it's like gold in that it has certain properties similar to it. Um, but this has sort of continued as crypto has continued to, to progress, including decentralized finance, which, in which they take the image of finance, of traditional already existing finance, and apply it to a decentralized uh, medium, <coughs> technological medium. Um, and so uh, this has continued as well. They say code is law, so they're equating code and law. They call it smart contracts, even though there is no connection to a legal system uh, when you're making a smart contract necessarily. Um, uh, you can apply this as well to uh, decentralized autonomous organizations, um, which used to be called decentralized autonomous corporations, where you can kind of see the, the, the political um, sort of ideology of the people who are like first involved in this technological space, which are largely very libertarian, very free market oriented people. Their idea of a decentralized autonomous corporation was that you can automate sort of everything inside of a company and therefore have more efficient you know, markets, have more efficient uh, capitalism in a sense. Uh, then Vitalik Buterin made the suggestion that maybe we should call it organization rather than corporation because you can create actually more than just corporations using smart contracts. And so, you know, that was a sort of expanding of, of that representational boundary. Um, you also see this as well. I think the network state is like uh, pure representational thinking to a, an extreme degree. Um, and as well, if we think about it in the art right now, uh, as far as NFTs go, the, what has happened because of kind of like the, the marketing around NFTs is that everyone, when they think of NFTs, they think of like board apes. They think of like a very specific image of what, of what NFTs are, and that being the kind of like dominant one that's sort of in people's faces a lot more. Um, but just to say that representational thinking is not, um, well, just that it is a very common tactic in marketing as a way to sell to people, right? Uh, you want to relate your product that you're trying to sell to a, a particular audience, to your market, so that you can convince them to separate themselves from their money um, and you can get paid for your, your work or your product or whatever else. Um, so I think the, the digital gold narrative, for example, was a really powerful one for a particular group of people because they already existed. They already sort of identified themselves as desiring gold and the gold standard as being the better form of money. And so people love to kind of consume their identity or you know, perform consumption in ways that sort of conform with the way that they see the world ought to be or uh, what they would ideally like to see the world become. Um, but so I like to pair this with a couple of other aphorisms that I think are really interesting. Another one, for example, is the map is not the territory. The word is not the thing it describes. Whenever the map is confused with the territory, a semantic disturbance is set up in the organism. The disturbance continues until the limitation of the map is recognized. Um, so with, with the book, what I'm trying to do is try to provide a new map for the crypto territory that isn't sort of consumed by the uh, assumptions that are often made by libertarians. Because what happens oftentimes is that people will come and they will want to learn about crypto or blockchain, but they are immediately sort of confronted with uh, a sort of angle that is very, very libertarian in nature, very, very free market oriented, has a, a lot of assumptions about the role of these things and whether they are good or not. Um, so I'm trying to, you know, um, note this uh, semantic disturbance so that a new map can be created. So, op so this book is meant to be uh, both for people who are, um, you know, wanting to learn more about this space, but also people who are already working in it, because uh, I think they need a kind of a, there needs to be a little bit of a re-education, I think, amongst the uh, people who are working on it if they want to build something better. Um, but I'd like to pair that as well with this model from George Box. All models are wrong, but some are useful. So I, you know, I'm not saying that it's uh, always wrong or bad to use a metaphor um, to try to understand something, but that some of them are better than others, and that we use metaphors um, in, in useful ways that, you know, um, uh, even though the map of Peru is not the same as Peru, it's still useful to have a map of Peru whenever you're walking around. You just can't, you know, encompass every little thing about it. But whatever, whenever you are thinking about um, modeling something or having some sort of representation, uh, there's an acknowledge there needs to be an acknowledgement that you are abs you're inherently abstracting away uh, things, and that what you are choosing to abstract is a political question, is like a, has political uh, consequences to that. Um, so I think a lot of the things that are abstracted away in crypto are things that are uh, oftentimes ignored by people who are building on it. 
Um, and so I think as well, this has, I didn't talk about this too much in the book, but um, I think this is very relevant to the concept of cultural hegemony from Antonio Gramsci that um, there is this kind of cultural hegemony in crypto around like what that free markets are kind of like the, the ultimate sort of form of coordination or communication amongst people and, that's, um, to, and that you can't really question that so much. Um, uh, and this is, I think, coming from like a kind of like the, the crypto ruling class kind of bringing down, but also I think you can argue that this comes from the ruling class generally anyways, um, and that this is sort of being brought down onto the crypto world. Um, and so in the book, I go through the three most common uh, representational forms of thinking in crypto that I see kind of like broadly uh, and going in kind of chronological order as it's developed. The first section is crypto as money, second is crypto as finance, and the third is crypto as coordination. Um, and then within each section, I just have a few different chapters where I go through uh, examples and sort of analysis and reasoning as to why that representational model um, is sort of incorrect or it doesn't fully encompass anything, uh, the, the, the full entirety of it. Um, but also how they are very similar. So for example, um, I say that you know, crypto is definitely not money as much as you know, the Bitcoiners want to believe that if we just believe hard enough, Bitcoin will become money. Um, but money has, of course, certain properties that it doesn't reach. Uh, but that this, the fact that it isn't money is not a bad thing. It doesn't actually really matter that it's not money. It's actually, in fact, potentially a good thing that it's not money, that you can use it to circumvent the monetary system because of the very fact that it is not money. Um, and so that's a kind of angle that's often, I find, uh, n not acknowledged when it comes to both what I categorize as on one side you have the gatekeepers, sort of like critics, and on the other side you have the hype men, the people who are trying to sell uh, the, the whole thing. Um, and so I think both of these kind of sides that are very, take oftentimes a very like pro or very anti position kind of sometimes miss. Um, but so what we see, I think, because I'm going in kind of chronological order, is that the representational model kind of has expanded each time. Um, so money, I think, encompassed a very, very small amount of, of, the, of the territory of crypto, but that expanded with finance and expanded again with this idea of that crypto is actually just coordination. But there are still plenty of problems with that that I go through in the book, how, you know, oftentimes it's coming from a like somewhat like libertarian still point of view about coordination. but. Um, whatever kind of you know, representational model uh, or type of thinking you want to apply onto the crypto world, it's never going to really fully encompass the, the full territory. Um, so it's, I think I find it sometimes quite problematic whenever we're like, trying to say that crypto is like, a like, specific thing when it is really like, a, a bit more complicated than that. Um, but so I think all this is, is important because um, the internet is not forever, as much as people want to believe that the sort of the image of what we thought the internet or the way that the internet was described in you know, the, its early days is very different than the way it's described today. And that's because the internet has evolved and has whatever different uh, capabilities. Um, but I think one of the things that has been like uh, problematic about the growth of the internet has been sort of like this reliance on the tech startup model as a way to build the vast majority of the kind of infrastructure that the internet or the people or users of the internet kind of um, rely upon. You know, I think it's something like five, five or so websites make up something like 90% of internet traffic or something like that. It takes up a huge amount. And so like the, when people say the internet, there is an image of what the internet is. And that image is oftentimes like Facebook, it is Google, it is simply the image that's provided us by very large corporates. And that ends up uh, actually limiting the imagination, of course, of like what we are able to do with it and what we ought to do with it. Um, the sort of functionality of what is built on the internet and therefore also in the crypto world is often uh, directed very much or influenced very heavily by uh, where the money is coming from or whether the fact that this particular function is one that is able to make a profit or not. And so that one will uh, be made. Um, and so, <clears throat> I wanted to as well, like the way that I kind of try to explain, show how I kind of explain to, uh, to crypto people like the kind of importance of what they're building and the sort of underlying infrastructure of what they're building, how that matters. Um, 
So, and that technological, the, technol the specific technological structure kind of uh, elicits particular outcomes. So if we look at, for example, just broadly, like a client-server model versus a peer-to-peer -peer model of, of architecture, um, we can see that there are new possibilities produced by having, like choosing either one of these. The client-server model is usually the you know, usual big tech kind of thing where your client is your application and the servers that hold all the data are owned by uh, the big tech companies. Um, whereas we saw sort of like the launch of Napster, which was like a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing service, we saw that it kind of had a material influence on the market, on the music market, that um, music revenues dropped considerably, um, and they haven't, I think as far as I've seen, they haven't really come up to the same numbers that they had in 1999, whenever Napster was first launched. But we can see as well that capital has sort of uh, adapted to this reality, where you know, Spotify basically looks like a kind of Napster, it's just that you pay you know, $10 a month or whatever in order to have like a more, a nicer user interface uh, and user experience um, than you would with like the, the old school Napster or LimeWire type of thing that you would have used. Um, as well, uh, new organizational structures allow new possibilities. So if we take the comparison between traditional corporations, which are hierarchical, which few people at the top own, uh, have the ownership over the company, and then versus cooperatives, which are more horizontally uh, organized organizations. Um, we see that this has a material effect where cooperatives tend to have much, much less wage inequality than traditional companies do, where you see that in the US, for example, the, uh, the ratio of, of wages is 339 to one from CEO to line worker average, which is huge. In the EU, it's also very big, it's 129 to one. And then whereas in cooperatives, at least if we look at like the big one, like Mondragon in Spain, it's either six to one or nine to one. Um, so we see that the wage inequality is very different because we're using very different organizational structures. Um, and so as well, if we can combine this a bit, we, say that, we can say that new socio-technological structures allow new possibilities. So the kind of the relationship that you have with, for example, your identity on, uh, on a blockchain, for example, versus what you have on a you know, big tech web two platform, uh, is very different that it's kind of, your identity is a bit, uh, has some amount of separation than what your, for example, your uh, Facebook or Google identity has. Um, and so uh, what we can see is that this kind of difference also allows uh, a, a kind of a new space a bit of kind of like a digitally native proto-cooperative behavior that we see in, for example, Uniswap, which is a big decentralized finance uh, exchange in which they did the, they had one of the first token drops where based on your use of their platform, they would give you tokens. There are uni tokens that would give you governance over the platform. There are of course many other problems with, with this project, but you know, this is from a very proto cooperative I'm saying. Um, you also have the creation of multi-signature wallets, which are basically like joint bank accounts. Um, and then you have different kind of uh, experimentations around collective ownership uh, of NFTs through things like PartyDAO is one, one project. Um, but so I wanted to go maybe dive a little bit deeper into uh, the art world, the NFT world. Um, one of kind of like the main uh, in, like way, the, help, the kind of like thinkers that helped me think about NFTs and art um, was Mackenzie Wark, uh, especially her piece, My Collectible Ass in which she tells a very funny story in which she was um, in some sort of, uh, at a party with a bunch of people from the arts world, and there was a famous artist there who was a, a performance artist, and he was somehow being able to sell his performance art to people, um, which is a quite strange thing. He was selling the, uh, um, the ability to learn how to do the performance art, so that was something that collectors were, were wanting, they were to, uh, just to, to learn how to do it. Um, and there would be like an official person who would there and sign off that this person has learned and whatever else. And then they were not allowed to teach other people as part of the contract that they signed. Um, but so uh, one of the things that she did and as like kind of a joke was like uh, she, she told one collector, oh, she has a, like a signature from another artist on her ass. Like, do you, do you want to see it? Uh, and they said, oh, no, 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 not at all. Even though they had just kind of like bought this uh, performance art piece in which they would uh, like aren't even able to tell other people, um, but that they, yeah, uh, but they still bought it anyways. Um, but like one of the conclusions out of this piece I thought was really interesting 
is that, um, or she says uh, at the bottom, that paradoxically, an object whose image is very widely spread is a rare object in the sense that few objects have their images spread widely. Um, so this can be exploited to create value in art objects that are not, in the traditional sense, rare and singular. The future of collecting may be less in owning the thing that nobody else has and more in owning the thing that everybody else has. So like there, it, there was this like very, um, you know, it was being alluded to in other presentations, but it was very strange kind of like uh, uh, arguments among people online that like, oh, what's the point of NFTs? I can click, you know, right click save. I'm, I'm, there was the artist who then like, saved all of the NFTs and put it into a repository. But what that ended up doing is that ended up reinforcing the, like, the actual NFT market, that it wasn't really nearly as subversive as they thought it was, but it did get a lot of clicks online. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so like, uh, I also kind of uh, looked into, did a little bit of research on the net art um, movement, um, and I thought it was really interesting. I'm a, I really like the work of Rhea Myers, um, where she basically copies, I can't remember who did the original simple net art diagram right now, but um, she made a kind of a corollary to that with just blockchain art, that the art happens here, but it happens inside the block. Um, and she made a piece in 2014, 2015, one of the first kind of blockchain art pieces on Ethereum called This Contract is Art in which there was just a function in the smart contract where you were, you were able to set it as it is art or it is not art. Um, so I thought it was just an interesting play of like uh, kind of thinking about art in, a, in the blockchain context. And this was before the existence of, of NFTs. Um, as well, uh, this piece from uh, Matt Dryhurst uh, where it's called, um, uh, well, I don't really know how to say it, Digital Scarcity, Peaceable Abundance, and the Shock of the Nude. Um, so like one of the you know, very common like, critiques that are talked about when it comes to the NFT world is about that, we're, that it's, adding a, it's adding digital scarcity into art markets, that what was originally uh, free is no longer free because you're making it an NFT. But his argument was that um, actually there is no addition of digital scarcity because anybody can take the picture of an NFT, for example, and they can still copy it, they can still see it, that making something an NFT does not limit anyone else's ability to, to consume it or to use it. Um, and instead, he argues that is uh, more of something about feasible abundance, that you actually get a bit of the best of both worlds where you can, um, the art is basically free, anybody can look at it, see it, consume it, but there is an opportunity for the creator or the artist to receive uh, some sort of, uh, some payment for, for that art. So, you just basically find whoever is like a very big fan and who wants to be a patron to be able to, to still do that. Um, but so, but one of the things that I think also as well that happened is that people were kind of seeing like, oh my gosh, this like hyper speculation is like crazy, it's terrible. Um, but the argument that he made is that the sort of speculative aspects of NFTs are kind of inherent to the art markets generally, and that the forces were not new, but they are nude that we're kind of being, we're, we're, we're shocked more about the, by seeing the truth than we are, that this is like necessarily a new thing. Um, and so this is a nice image of the woman freaking out that this painting shows, you know, someone who is naked, that we're kind of just being shocked by the, the spectacle of it rather than uh, anything of, of real substance. Um, but I think there are, although there's a lot of crap in the uh, NFT markets, how you want to call it, um, I tried to find some pretty interesting examples or what I thought were interesting examples of, uh, of like in the art world in, in the NFT space or in the blockchain art space, you want to be more expansive. Um, and so here are just a couple examples I, I mentioned in the book. Um, Song Camp was interesting because they kind of did a combinate, there was a very, very collective sort of creation of different songs that would be accompanied with uh, digital art. So there is a lot of collaboration between different types of artists in which they would spend like a couple of weeks doing these song camps in which they would um, have four or five artists, artists, something like that, come together and make a song and then they would create a collection of songs in which that would be sold um, a along with a digital piece of art which would be uh, uh, sort of randomized with different types of layers. So each, each song was paired with a a piece of art that made it very unique. So you could sell five NFTs of one song, but they would have each 
a different kind of image that went along with it. Um, and then they use that and they use a thing called a split. So it's a type of contract where um, whenever there is a sale, all the sales are immediately sort of split among all of the uh, contributors to that piece of work. Um, as well, uh, let's see, Hick at Nunk, this uh, one on the left here is interesting in showing that it was a NFT marketplace that was on Tezos, it's another blockchain. And uh, the founder of Hick at Nunk uh, just kind of gave up. He didn't want to do it anymore. So he shut down the website. And so there was this kind of initial panic that everybody had lost their art that they had put on Hick at Nunk. Um, but what actually happened is that the only thing that sort of was gone at that point was just the, um, the front end of the application. So only the, the user interface that people were using to buy and sell these NFTs was gone, but the NFTs and the contracts that they were a part of were still in existence. And so immediately, sort of days after, people were able to make new front ends or new UIs that took the same NFTs that were already created and put them onto a new front end. So none of the work was lost. And I think that was really interesting because especially, I mean, for me as a, as a content creator, um, there is a kind of like risk in using platforms. So uh, Matt Dryhurst talked about this as well, that there is platform risk for, I mean, artists, for content creators, that where you put your piece of art, uh, there is a risk that the platform that you are putting it on may change its laws, its, its rules, it may like go bankrupt. So it's happened oftentimes where uh, some platform goes bankrupt and then all the work is sort of lost. Um, but in this case, because the content itself was held uh, on a blockchain, it was, you know, it was not lost. Um, another interesting example, I think, is Culture Stake, which was started, created by the people from Furtherfield, which is an art collective in London, um, where they, I think it was like Plinth Park or something like that, they sort of went out there and they did a vote amongst people who would come through the park. Uh, and they, would, they had a pro proposal for two different pieces of work of art that they would put on the park. And so people could vote on which piece that they would prefer to be put up into the park. So they were using, uh, for me, this felt like what was talking about earlier, a bit of like a democratization of, of art to some extent that I thought uh, worked. Uh, it seems like it worked uh, decently well. It was, a very, it was a pretty small experiment, but I thought it was quite interesting. Um, there is this, so the, um, uh, Holly Herndon is someone else who is a partner of, of Matt Dryhurst. She's using um, NFTs as a way to um, basically create official um, like audio recordings of the use of her voice because she created a, a, a voice AI called Holly Plus. Uh, and Holly Plus is sort of uh, also has what's called a Holly DAO in which people who are part of the DAO are able to vote on whether some sort of uh, someone who has used her, her model to make a new song, whether or not that would be considered an official song, and then that would be sold as an NFT. So her, her Holly Plus voice model is open source. Um, so anybody can, can kind of submit that. Um, and then as well, this sort of like list of different like medieval like uh, fantasy uh, uh, equipment uh, comes from a project called Loot, in which they just created basically NFTs of text and the text was just a list of kind of fantasy items. And the idea was to reverse the process in which how games are created oftentimes. So usually, um, you know, a game is created where you, you create the world and then you create the, the stuff that's going to be in it. And then, you know, it's sort of like owned by whoever owns the game. Um, in this way, they were trying to create the items of the game first and then allow anybody else to be able to create the game around it. So there, are, there is this kind of like ecosystem of different loot games where people have, uh, you know, you, if you have an NFT of one of, of one of these loots, you can play an assortment of different games that a bunch of different people have made, not just like one company or something like that. So it's a bit of a, a reversal that I thought was interesting. Um, and so, yeah, sort of like the, the main like uh, point that I tried to have people uh, take away with with any of my with this presentation uh, is this can summarize can be summarized here is that we need to build collectively owned digital infrastructure that we need to move away from this model of the tech startup in which just a few people own um, that infrastructure and instead build things that are able to be collectively uh, owned and governed for the people who who use that infrastructure. 
Um, and yeah, so the book, I got some nice quotes from, from different people, including Vitalik, Buterin, uh, Nick Cernick, Prima Verde Filippi, Nathan Schneider, a bunch of other people. Um, and then if you still don't know if you want it, there is a, a review on Coindesk. And I also have books with me, so if you would like one, um, you can buy one. <laughs> um, and I will sign it. Uh, so yeah, that's it.